Amen. Thank you, Brother Matt. Good to see all of you here tonight. Those of you who are online, we're a little scattered, scatterbrained here tonight. I forget that I have to be somewhat on time because I have people wanting to watch us online. So thank you all for being here. We're getting more and more back on Wednesday nights, and we appreciate that. Um, so thank you for being faithful. Uh, I just flew in from Branson. My arms are tired, and uh, the old joke. Um, we did just come in from Branson about two hours ago, and we're at uh, Jubilee. Are we, are we on, Jeremy? <laughs> okay. Um, we took about 12 of us to uh, Jubilee this year. We've had more go. Okay, we're up. Okay. Hi to all of you online. We're here. Uh, I was talking about Jubilee. Um, and Jubilee is a senior adult conference uh, put on by Johnny Hunt and his team. He, former pastor at Woodstock, Georgia, um, been Southern Baptist president. Uh, he's got a tremendous testimony. He uh, grew up shooting pool. Uh, his dad, I think, died at the age of seven. He was an alcoholic. Uh, was saved at the age of about 18 or 19 years of age. God did a miraculous work in his life, and he began to preach, pastor. And so God has really blessed him. So anyway, uh, he's, he does some pastor's conferences uh, called Timothy and Barnabas conferences, but this uh, Jubilee conference is for senior adults. So um, we went uh, Monday at noon, got down there, got the, over there to Branson, we stay in motels. Um, it starts that Monday evening, and they get some of the best Southern Gospel groups to come in and sing. Uh, Johnny teaches and preaches a couple of times. Uh, we heard uh, Will Graham today, who is the grandson of Billy Graham, the son of Franklin Graham, who is now an evangelist and preaching, and he did a tremendous job this morning challenging us in the area of evangelism. And Brother Johnny always has some good teaching and preaching for us. We heard the, uh, some of you were here when we had the Collinsworth family uh, here a year ago, December, for a Christmas concert. They were the main uh, group, uh, and they were last night. Did a wonderful job. The Blackwood Brothers, uh, some of you are familiar with them. The Lefevre uh, Quartet, uh, Gold City uh, was there as well. So we heard some really wonderful uh, Christian music, and some great preaching. The Lawrence Welk Theater there is about 3,500 in a tent, uh, as far as seating. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't fill it up this year. They did do some distancing within the seats, but I, I suspect there was probably between 2,000 and 2,500 people, and that was for the first, uh, first part of the week. We left today at noon, and there's another group that just got there. Trinity Baptist of Grove is there this evening. They will stay through Friday morning at noon. So anyway, it's something that we try to do every year. I would encourage you all as senior adults to think about that. Um, it doesn't cost all that much, and uh, it is a great uh, opportunity to fellowship together. Uh, like I said, 12 of us, we took the church uh, minibus or a new van, and we were able to, uh, I was the bus driver, and uh, so I take that, that responsibility on. I take you right to the door. We let you out, help you get out. Uh, you know, you get curbside service when you go with us, okay? So we promise you. Denise, I see you tonight. Denise Norm Smith go normally goes with us. But see, when Denise goes with us, we have to attach a trailer behind the bus because she goes shopping while we're there. <laughs> she loves me to tease her about that. So we didn't have to take a, a, a trailer this year because Denise was not able to go with us. So anyway, but... We would love to take, instead of the new van, we would love to take our church bus, which holds 29 people. And we'll put the, we'll put the trailer on the back of it if you all want to go. So think about that. You can drive yourself. If we had a couple of, uh, some couples that decided they wanted to drive, didn't want to necessarily ride on the bus, and then once we got there, then they uh, uh, went with us each and every time. We uh, go out and eat together, and... Uh, 
just have some great uh, fellowship. Just think of the fact that you've got 35, you know, somewhere between 25 and 3,000 senior adults from all over the United States there, and uh, singing and praising the Lord. And our, uh, we have a celebrity, uh, celebrity among us. He's not here tonight. I think we wore him out. Uh, we'll recognize him Sunday. But uh, Tony Zeni was the oldest individual there at the conference, just barely. He's almost 95. And so he was not only the oldest member there for, uh, for Jubilee, but he was also the oldest uh, veteran there. So they gave him a special prize and actually let him have a microphone for a little bit, which is dangerous. I told them they needed to watch that, but uh, anyway. But we had a great time. So you all think about that. If you've never been to uh, Jubilee, think about it. It's every year. Next year, it's a little bit later in April. I think it's like April the 27th. Uh, through the 29th. We try to go the first part of the week, uh, if we can, the Monday through Wednesday. So when you hear about Jubilee, uh, you'll want to uh, uh, get involved with that, put down a deposit, let us know that you're interested in going, okay? All right. Um, I have some extras. I don't, I'm trying to think. I may not have made enough. I passed out last week the spiritual preparation for revival. If you were here, you got one. Now, whether you have it with you, that's another question tonight. I hope you kept it in your Bible. But I have some more of these tonight. And it has uh, spirit, spiritual preparation. And then it has the corresponding verses that go with this. And this is a, a really nice tool to prepare your heart for revival, uh, your daily quiet time. Use this. I'll have this available for you tonight if some of you did not get one last week and so we'll uh, look at that um let's see let me our first conference is coming up folks we're less than two weeks away uh, i will preach this coming sunday uh, one more opportunity to share with you about uh, spiritual renewal and then i've been in contact with the the team there and they will be traveling a week from this coming, well, actually, it's a week from tomorrow, I believe, uh, they will be coming uh, to, uh, uh, some of the leaders will come in first, and then the team comes in on Friday, and uh, we will begin the process of, uh, uh, they'll go through the church uh, buildings and uh, kind of get themselves familiar. And then Saturday, on that Saturday, May the 1st, uh, they will set up things, getting preparation for the first conference, and then we'll kick it off that Sunday morning, May the 2nd. May the 2nd through May the 5th, I pray that you will make time for revival. That's, uh, that's what you have to do, folks. You have to make time for it. Uh, doesn't mean that God is going to uh, allow his Holy Spirit to fall down upon us, but if we will make time and if we will prepare, I believe that God will, will answer prayer. And uh, I pray that you all will, uh, that all of us, including myself, will prepare our hearts for that. Uh, we pretty well have everything set up. Uh, people have volunteered uh, to use loaner, uh, to let their cars be used as loaner vehicles. Some of you have opened up your homes uh, to allow some of these uh, young single adults, male and female, to uh, live in your home for a week. And uh, we appreciate so much doing that. They really like to do that. We obviously have a, uh, um, uh, let's see, it's called a retreat center. That's what it's called, a cabin out at uh, GLBA. And we could have put most of them in there, but they would not have the interaction and contact with you as individuals of our church and so uh, I think you will be blessed for those of you who are opening up your homes and again I just encourage you ladies uh, on that Tuesday May the 4th there is a ladies luncheon uh, the, it's designed especially for you all uh, the two pastors wives that will be in the group will be sharing and there will be a very nice lunch for you that day. You don't have to worry. You know, you don't have to bring anything. Just bring yourselves. 
Uh, we'll have a sign-up list this coming Sunday, but let me encourage you to make preparation for that as well. If you have children, we're going to provide uh, child care that day, and uh, we will make sure that uh, you have the opportunities to be a part of that. So uh, be thinking about that as well. We've not really said a whole lot in reference to um, inviting people. Folks, this is really, it's really a, uh, it's a revival for the church. But if you have individuals that might be interested in coming, the gospel is going to be shared. It's going to be preached. And I promise you, I'm not going to get upset if, uh, if a lost person comes to know Christ. I can tell you that right now. Uh, we will rejoice and be excited. But let me, let me suggest this to you. Some of you know some church members that have not been coming. Some of you might know individuals that used to be members of this church years ago, and for some reason they have fallen away. The, you know, whatever reason, they choose not to uh, uh, come back and be a part of us. But maybe this would be an opportunity for you to uh, take some personal time and just invite them back and see. Who knows? The Lord, uh, you know, can uh, do great things when it comes to these type of things. And we just want to see God move within our midst. If we will get right with God, um, I, I think I, I came up with, uh, I, I don't know if it's actually original, but if we have a passion for Christ, or we have a, a passion for the Lord, we will get a passion for the lost. Um, but the passion has to come for the Lord first. We have to get right with him and renew that steadfast, steadfast spirit uh, within us. And we need to make sure that we're right with God. And then we begin to look out. And what, Je what did Jesus do? He began to uh, share with those who were lost and willing to, uh, he had compassion on them, and so those are some things that we want to do. Yes, sir. Well, Philip, um, you know, a person can uh, get right with the Lord, or, or let's say, for instance, if, if a person is lost, they are released from their addiction, they come to know Christ. Uh, they have an uh, intense desire to serve the Lord as a new believer. They begin to share their faith. They begin to see either people come to know the Lord or they begin to share their faith. All of us can get sidetracked uh, in our walk with Christ. If we're not careful, uh, we can look at men rather than look at the Lord. I've seen a lot of people who have been disillusioned either by a, um, a disgruntled relationship, maybe with a pastor, maybe they got upset at a pastor, a music director, a youth minister, or another church member. And all I'm saying by that is, is that sometimes we allow excuses to get in the way of us serving the Lord. We're not always going to be on cloud nine. We're not always going to be on the mountaintop when it comes to our faith in Christ. Uh, but there should be a steady growth that leads us into full knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, each individual situation is probably going to be different, uh, Philip. But usually we allow sin to come back in and keep us from serving Christ with all of our heart. So... That's the best I can explain to you at that point without uh, knowing the particulars, okay? So uh, let me share with you tonight before we get into, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 18. Um, I'm just going to, uh, I like to let you know uh, as a church family, when there are ethical issues that are out there that are going on, 
Um, I was kind of out of pocket the last couple of days. When you're going from one conference to the next, sometimes not able to look at the news, see what's going on. Had a beautiful snow yesterday in Branson, as you obviously had one here probably a little earlier than we did. So uh, it was nice. Uh, didn't stay around very long, but it was pretty. And the fact that it snowed in April, latter part of April, that, that was impressive too. But uh, it was a little nippy this morning when we got up, but, uh, you know, um, Oklahoma weather, Missouri weather, just uh, if you uh, uh, are not sure about it, just wait. It'll change on you. So uh, anyway, um, but there was uh, uh, one of our church members made me aware of this, that uh, the Oklahoma Senate has sent three anti-abortion bills to Governor Stitt. Um, they are uh, bills that require... Uh, physicians who perform abortions to be certified in the, basically they have to be an OBGYN to be able to perform abortion there also is a fetal heartbeat bill uh, which uh, if any doctor performed an abortion after detecting a heartbeat would be guilty of homicide and uh, I'm trying to remember let's see there was three of them uh, one that criminalized the procedure Oh, cost providers that are medical expenses for performing them send measures to the government for or governor for approval. Uh, anyway, there are some, um, these are some pretty tough laws, uh, I mean bills that are being sent to the governor. Now, he has five days to either sign them, veto them, or whatever, and if he doesn't do anything after five days, they automatically become law. Now, there's going to be, cha I'm going to tell you right now, there are going to be challenges to this. Uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, uh, there's one lady who uh, had already opened up a uh, abortion clinic there in the Oklahoma City area. Uh, she said that there would be lawsuits. They'll come from, uh, there'll be national money that'll come in from Planned Parenthood that will try to block these uh, immediately. Now, the situation with that is, is if they do get blocked, then you go through the appeal process and does it eventually end up in the Supreme Court? One of these bills, one of the bills from some of the other states, uh, could end up uh, becoming before the Supreme Court and a decision made. Uh, you know, Roe v. Wade has been the law of the land since 1973, um, and it took away all the states. Different states had laws regulating abortions. Roe v. Wade made it federal took away all the, all the laws within the individual states. If Roe v. Wade was to be overturned, that does not mean abortions would cease in America. It just simply means it would go back to the states, and the states would have the opportunity to regulate. New York is going to be very uh, pro-abortion. California is going to be very pro-abortion. Oklahoma and some of the southern states would probably then have the... Um, would probably have a direction or would probably want to see uh, abortion outlawed uh, pretty much period unless the threatened life of the mother that's usually the exception that some of them will use just ask you to pray about it um, I've been in the pro-life movement uh, for years uh, since 1992 I've been in I've been in trying to help our state to uh, try to get laws that would like parental, parental notification um, uh, you know laws that uh, you know allowed uh, at least minors could not go off and be shipped off and have an abortion without their parents knowledge and things like that now what, what wherever you're at on the issue of abortion I believe that it is the taking of human life uh, and uh, so you have to as an individual come to a point as a Christian where, where you stand on that issue and some people just want to keep it out of sight, out of mind. I, I personally believe that if we will um, uh, do the right thing, we're never going to be able to stop all of them, but anything that we can do to... Yeah, what we're finding more and more in our crisis pregnancy centers, which Oklahoma Baptists, we support several, and we've got one here in our own uh, community uh, with our Minister Alliance, we have uh, 
a, uh, a board, let's see, the ABC's Blessing Center has a sonogram machine in there. When the uh, crisis pregnancy centers get a sonogram machine and the women are able to see a sonogram before they choose whether to have a child or not, 80-some percent of them that watch the sonogram and see that unborn child in their womb end up choosing life. So it's a significant number. So just want to ask you to you know, pray for our governor, pray for the legislators, those that are making the laws within our state, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. I had pulled this up while I was at Branson, this other article, and it really just, uh, <laughs> it bothers me because this affects who I am as a pastor. But here's the headline. This is from Religious News Service. Planned Parenthood announces new clergy advocacy board members, many from red states. So basically, now here, here's, the, here's the little pin. I stand with Planned Parenthood. And we have pastors in the United States of America that support Planned Parenthood. Now, folks, if you don't know who, well, who Planned Parenthood is, now they say they, they br give a lot of services to women uh, as far as uh, care, but they are in the abortion business. Let's just face it. And so you need to understand that. And the new Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock he is a minister in the Atlanta area, and he is one that has signed on to the Planned Parenthood Advocacy Board member uh, situation. They have some, uh, they put a few out. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be real honest here. Uh, a lot of these are lady ministers. And we don't have lady ministers in our congreg in our in Southern Baptist life. We we believe that that is uh, limited to males. But I do see a lot in this article uh, of females in other denominations that are going for this. It, it's called the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. It's a big word organization that say they support abortion. So. Just wanted to let you know about that. Abortion, uh, folks, abortion will never be se uh, settled in the United States of America because we never had a national referendum on it. The Supreme Court took it away from us in 1973. So I just ask you to pray about it. Um, I, had a, I had a lady come up to me when I was in Maysville, Oklahoma, pastoring there. And we had a, we did a life chain one Sunday, and then we went to the state capitol. We were one of the, it was, at that time was the largest rally f uh, that Oklahomans had ever had come to the state capitol. It was back in 1991. It was in January. I think it was on the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday that we went up there. We made the effort uh, between 25 and 30,000 Oklahomans gathered together that day on the Capitol steps. And one of the ladies that went with us, she told the story. She told me the story afterwards. She, their, let's see, one, two, their second child, and they had uh, three girls and a boy, but their second daughter, when they did the ultrasound and did some tests, the OBGYN told her that their daughter had spina bifida which is a hole in the spine. And he recommended that she have an abortion. Well, her and her husband, they were very strong Christians, pro-life. They just didn't believe in that. And they said, Lord, whatever you give us, we will love this child. They had a healthy little girl. Her name is Keisha. She's married to a, um, a man today who is in the ministry. Uh, she has had children herself. Now, she did have... A hole in her spine. She technically had spina bifida, but she did not have the complications. But if they would have listened to that doctor, they would have aborted that, that baby, and she was a healthy, perfect child. Had a hole in her spine, but everything was fine. So she shared that testimony, and I'll never forget that. And 
uh, I uh, have used her over the years as an example of what uh, we need to do. We need to pray. I mean, my, we, our, our three daughters, each time the, doctor, the OBGYN would come in and say, well, now we were th thinking about doing the amniocentesis. And I'd say, Doc, what's that for? Well, it's to determine whether you're going to have any problems, you know, if you have birth defects in the child. And we looked at the first doctor, who was a Christian doctor out of First Baptist Church, Altus, Oklahoma. We said, uh, Doc, uh, we believe that God has given us this baby, and whatever happens, whether he or she is healthy or whatever, we don't think we need to do that procedure, and we'll take whatever God gives us. So three times we had the opportunity for the amniocentesis. All I'm sharing with you in regards to that is we decided whatever God gave us. Now, we were fortunate we had three healthy children, but some people don't. But folks, I've talked to families today. I've talked to couples who've had uh, Down syndrome children, and they are some of the most precious kids you'll ever meet and see and experience. But if it was up to Planned Parenthood and some of the groups in America today, they would cease to exist. Let's just be honest. So what you believe about life, I believe that life begins in the womb and goes all the way to the tomb. And, and if you're, you say, well, I'm a senior adult, I don't need to worry about that, Brother Jim. Yeah, you do. Because the same people that want to abort babies want to terminate older adults that get in the way. Okay? There was a governor in Colorado years ago. It's been 15, 20 years ago. But he told the senior adults at that time, he said, do us a favor and just go ahead and die. Help us out. Well, folks, I believe that life is precious. It is a gift from God. So uh, anyway, th that was free. didn't cost you a thing tonight. So uh, anyway, has nothing. that particular subject ha doesn't have anything to do with what I'm going to share as far as revival tonight. But I do believe it is killing us as a nation, literally and spiritually. Okay? So anyway, I want to share with you from 1 Kings chapter 18 tonight. Under the title is Revival Being Hindered. And I think I can get this in before Matt needs to uh, have his um, choir practice tonight. Let me just uh, open us in a word of prayer. Father, tonight meet with us. I, uh, Lord, I'm just a pastor who desires to preach the word and try to teach tonight from your word your word is powerful every scripture all scripture every part of scripture is god breathed you said that in your word father it is profitable for us tonight we need to be studying it we need to be meditating on it we need to uh, internalize that word we need to obey your commands father we need to love you with all of our heart as it says we need to love our neighbor as ourselves we need to have a compassion for lost people lord if we're not careful we'll be guilty tonight of basically saying to some people in this area that they are not worth any significance the world says there are people who are worth something and there are those who are not worth something. But Lord, in, in your word, it tells us that all life is precious. So Father, help us tonight to um, listen to your word. We're going to use Elijah in his example tonight in his dealings with the prophets of Baal. Father, just help us to understand what you want for us tonight. We give you praise, honor, and glory. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Um, in 1 Kings chapter 18, very familiar passage of Scripture to some because it's the situation uh, dealing with the uh, prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. This is one of those places some of us uh, that have been to Israel, uh, we went to Mount Carmel, got to see there is a statue of Elijah there. I believe there is a church there, a Catholic church. 
and a beautiful view. You can look off into the the Valley of uh, Hinnon, and uh, you can. Uh, we were, in fact, we were sitting there, or we were standing there watching, and our guide said, "Look out over there. You see that runway right there? Those two runway strips. That is a Air Force base. There was just two strips, and all of a sudden, these two airplanes appeared." From the ground two f-16s f-18s whatever they were and they took off from there and they could be into uh, lebanon syria within a matter of minutes and uh, very strategic point some people believe that that's where the battle of armageddon is going to be uh, in that valley there but that beautiful uh, uh, picture of uh, up there on the hillside uh, on a pretty much a small mountaintop there's Mount Carmel and uh, uh, there you have the situation so um, just wanted to share that with you because this is when my Bible that sometimes is just black and white has colors because I was there some of you've been there before as well to Israel and so it, it becomes a little bit more significant when you have been at a place that scripture teaches um, I was reading fr about the philosopher Dr. Francis Schaeffer. He was one of the great Christian apologists in our day and time. Passed away, eh, I'm going to say it's probably been 15, 20 years or so ago. But he warned as an apologist, and I, I don't mean he, he apologized for Christianity, but he defended Christianity. Dr. Schaeffer warned us that one day we would wake up and find that the America that we once knew would be gone. Folks, that's happening. Well, we're here. So the America that we once knew is, is, is changing. Um, what Schaefer disdained more than anything was what he called secular humanism, and that is the worldview that cast aside the core message of the Christian faith in favor of basically just devoiding or, uh, uh, the Christian values. Um, why has our society changed, he asked. The answer is clear. The consensus of our society no longer rests upon a Christian basis, but upon a humanistic one. Human humanism is man putting himself at the center of all things rather than the creator God. The results, Schaefer argued, was a society that had lost its moral foundation and threatened to ship, shipwreck itself on the shoals of Western civilization. And so if we are going to be Bible-believing Christians, we need to practice simultaneously at each step of the way two biblical principles that are going to be found based on this passage. One principle principle will be would be the purity of the church okay scripture commands that we must do more than just talk about the purity of the visible church we must actually practice it and folks it will be costly if we try to live the christian life in our society today it will cost us something uh, we will have to give up things we may have to suffer ridicule. We may lose friends because we are willing uh, to go this route and trust God in this measure. The second principle is that uh, of uh, uh, an uh, observable love among true Christians, an observable love. Not just saying that you love people, but it's something that people can observe. Uh, in the flesh, we can stress purity without love, or we can stress love without purity. But we cannot stress both simultaneously. To do so, we must look moment by moment to the work of Christ and to the Holy Spirit. So what can happen is, is without having a balance, a stress on purity becomes hard, proud, legalistic. And then likewise, without the stress on love, 
we compromise, just sheer compromise. So we need to have both of them. We need to have the holiness of God. We need to have the love of God. We'll never be able to do it perfectly, but we must look at the living Christ to help us to do it truly, okay? So the church in our generation today needs reformation, it needs revival, and it needs a constructive revolution. Now, folks, we're in the process of having a revolution in America, but it's not good. There are people who are calling for revolution. There are individuals who want to fundamentally change this country, and one of them occupies the White House today. His boss, when he was vice president, said the same words. We want to fundamentally transform America. But you see, they didn't tell us what they wanted to fundamentally transform or change. Now they do. And folks, it's not pretty. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that any, you know, anybody, you know, uh, whatever president has ever occupied the office of president uh, has always had failures and always have had problems, okay? Some have tried to acknowledge God more than others. Some have been a friend to the Christians more than others. But I'm here to share with you tonight that there is a revolution happening, but it's not happening in the church. So we need reformation, revival, and constructive revolution. This cannot be true, there cannot be true revival unless there has been reformation, and reformation is not complete without revival. So we come to 1 Kings chapter 18. You have your Bibles here tonight. I believe that Elijah, and I give credit to Dr. Adrian Rogers, I was at his church back in 1991 and 1993. He had uh, a couple of Bible conferences there for pastors and people all over the country, but mainly, primarily pastors. And the church at Maysville allowed me to go both times, and Lori and I and the girls packed up and drove to uh, Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm going to tell you, it was, a, it was just an exciting time uh, to be there. Dr. Rogers, uh, uh, anybody that's been in the Southern Baptist Convention uh, has, you know, that, that booming voice of Dr. Rogers, you can still hear him to this day on the radio, uh, his Love Worth Finding Ministries, but I, I give, uh, certainly give him credit for some of the information because I took notes there, and, and I think the first Bible conference was entitled Let the Fire Fall, and it was based on Elijah, the fire coming down from heaven. Folks, God was the one that caused the fire to come down. We can't do that. All we can do is make the necessary preparations so that God can and will bring the fire down okay so let's look at this i'm going to begin reading in verse 20 of chapter 18 first kings it's on uh, page 515 in my bible does that help anybody nope didn't think so it's it's right before second kings i have a keen sense of the obvious don't i and it's right after first and second samuel okay so try to find it there in the old testament if you, you, you know, if you hit the middle of your Bible, it'd usually come to Psalms and just make a left, okay, if you go to Psalms, okay? All right, here we go. 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 20. It says, So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the prophets, I, am, am, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up, place it on the wood, Put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. 
Then you will call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and God will answer by fire. He is God, or the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, this is a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves, prepare, for it. prepare it first for you, are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leapt about the altar which they made. It came about noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a, a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside or is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves, according to their custom, with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Take note of that. The altar of the Lord had been torn down and was in disrepair because they were not sacrificing. Okay? Uh, let's see. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood, cut the ox in pieces, and had it on the wood, laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. I just want to share with you to pause. Uh, this was being taught in Sunday school to some kids one day. And, someone, and so the teacher was trying to, you know, try to help out with the, the lesson and everything. He said, why do you think Elijah had the water poured in the trenches? The little boy raised his hand and said, that's for the gravy. Some of you will get that in a minute. The ox, meat, gravy, never mind. All right, here we go. All right, verse 36. Now, here's Elijah's prayer. Notice his prayer. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. He is God, the Lord, he is God. Now I'm going to stop there. You know the rest of the story and what happened on Mount Carmel. They got rid of those 450 Baal prophets. By the way, Baal... It was a sexual type God. Uh, it was very uh, immoral. Uh, and that's where the people, that altar was okay, but it was the Lord's altar that was in d disrepair. So Elijah followed a formula or a pattern, if you must, that I believe brought revival because notice that it said there that the Lord, uh, when, when he answered, it says, Answer me, O Lord, and let them know that you have turned their heart back again. Folks, that is a picture right there of revival. Turning their hearts back to the Lord. We've turned away from him. We've allowed the things of this world. We've allowed circumstances, situation. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you don't understand why God has allowed some things to happen in your life. Maybe you've suffered a tremendous loss and you just can't understand why in the world would the Lord allow that to happen in my life? What he, why would he allow my health to deteriorate like this? 
There's a lot of things that can happen, folks, that cause us to, uh, to take our eyes off the Lord. Or uh, it can cloud our vision. It can cloud our understanding of who God is. And so Elijah followed this pattern to bring revival. The first thing he did was solidarity. He brought the people together in solidarity. We need to bring or to begin to unify the body of Christ. And I'm not just talking about us as believers in this congregation. Folks, if we truly want to have a revival in Grove, Oklahoma, we need our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ from other churches. They need to experience it. We shouldn't be selfish. Well, God's only going to speak to those at First Baptist. I mean, how foolish would that be? It's not going to happen. But God could use us as the start of it. And so this Thirst Conference could be the beginning, folks, of something really special if we are willing to unify, okay? When people are blood-bought brothers and sisters in Christ, they have a desire to come together because they see that there's an urgent need. Folks, look around. This world is going to hell in a handbasket, as they say. Not only was there solidarity, but there was also a separation. The trench that Elijah dug formed a line of demarcation to separate the worshipers of Jehovah from the worshipers of Baal. And for us, we need to separate from a moral perspective those who do not believe in the truths of God's Word. Folks, we can't, what does light have in common with darkness? And so we have to, now, please understand, I'm not saying that we need to go get into our ivory towers and wait till Jesus comes back and just sit there. But we need to separate ourselves from a moral perspective. And then certainly we need to let people know that we love God with all of our hearts. And then he will give us a love for people. Not only is there separation, but there's sacrifice. You see, the blood of Jesus, the power of Christ on the cross has absolutely decimated the kingdom of Satan, you and I just don't live like it. Folks, Satan has been defeated, in case you haven't realized. Now, I realize he has a lot of power. I realize today in America there's a lot of things going on and it looks bad, but Jesus wins, and he's already conquered sin, death, and hell. And we need to start acting like it as believers. Remember what it was said in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11? And they overcame him, speaking of the devil, by the blood of the Lamb. The blood is the basis for our warfare. And yet there are people that are trying to take away the blood of Christ. There are people today that don't want us to sing about it. But folks, without the shed blood of Christ, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So we need sacrifice. And then the supplication. Solidarity, separation, sacrifice. Then look at the supplication. Uh, Elijah's prayer, 63 words. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that the people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Folks, his prayer was precise, it was powerful, and it was purposeful because he wanted the people to know who the real God is. The world has all their gods Baal was the, he was the popular God in that day and time. He was getting more activity than the Lord God was, Jehovah, Yahweh. But Elijah's prayer was that they might know 
the one true God and who he is. And folks, fire came down from heaven and it was God, the true God, that did it. Now, what we need to ask ourselves tonight, have we stopped believing that God can reach the unreachable? Are there some individuals out there tonight that we have just kind of written off and said, man, you know, God, I just don't know that you can change that person's heart. Have we stopped believing that God can do the impossible? Folks, Jesus touches the untouchables, and he reaches the unreachable. And folks, he did it here in 1 Kings 18, and he can do it again. Amen? And it can begin right here. So I just wanted you to understand revival can be hindered if we take our eyes off the one true God and begin to allow the allures of the world to dominate us. The altar of the Lord was in disrepair because it had not been used. Because the people of God were not sacrificing to the one true God. But they sure were sacrificing to the false gods. Now you say, well, Brother Jim, we don't have altars of where we, ha you know, we offer sacrifices to false gods. Okay, I understand that we don't do that literally. But folks, we've got our own gods, and some of them are very sophisticated. We've got people today who are more interested in fame and fashion. They're more interested in, uh, in wealth. There are people today that, are tr that they have bought into the secular humanism that man is going to have to help himself get out of all of this mess. Folks, I'm telling you, man's the one that has got us into this mess, and I'm included in that, but only God can get us out of it. Okay, so let's begin tonight. Let's make sure, God, I don't want to be the one. I don't want to be the one that hinders what you want to do. I want the fire to fall from heaven. But in order for that to happen, folks, we're going to have to put our eyes back on the Lord. We need to quit hesitating. Remember what Elijah said back there. He said, "Quit hesitating." choose are you going to serve the true god you're going to serve the false one get off the fence you can't have it both ways christian make a decision tonight decide lord i'm not going to get in your way i want the fire to fall and i want it to begin in my life and if we'll do that then folks We'll see the impossible. We'll see the unreachable being reached. We'll see the, the, the impossible things begin, become possible. Now, we've had revival meetings before. You, if you've been in church very long, you know that. But maybe this year, maybe 2021, maybe based on what's happened the last year and a half, and, and the things that are going on in this world, maybe that is what needs to happen to get us to the point that we are desperate, desperate to follow the Lord, okay? So that's my challenge to you tonight. Yes, sir. Well, let's, let's just start with the church, okay? Let's just start with the church. God wants us to get right first, okay, Philip? Okay. I understand what you're saying, but let's start right here, okay? That's what we're asking. Well, and then as God, as God touches our hearts, we'll do that, okay? We'll see what we can do, okay? Shut up, Philip. All right. Let me share with you a prayer request uh, or two before we pray. And uh, if you don't have the uh, preparation guides here, they're up here in the front. Please take those. Those are important. They will help you. They start with personal revival. Then they 
go into the church area and then it goes into the evangelism part for lost. And again, we're not necessarily going out and, and grabbing the lost and bringing them in for the service. But folks, listen, if you have somebody who is lost and you would love for them to come and they would be willing to come to this, I promise you they're going to they're gonna hear the gospel, okay? But we want more than anything, if God's people will get right with him and right with one another and develop that passion once again for him, then it will translate out into our community and we'll love the lost as well, okay? Uh, I was asked, to, to, there's an addition to the prayer list tonight, a uh, niece of John Hillis, uh, Vicki Gibbs had kidney stone surgery, and so we want to remember her today. Uh, one of our church members, um, well, I'm looking here at the prayer, oh, it's up at the top. Uh, I'm a Jean Halstead. Uh, she had uh, a bladder procedure that did not go well. They, <clears throat> they were not able to do the surgery. There were some issues. Uh, she is okay, but it just didn't go the way they were hoping. So pray for uh, Imogene tonight. Uh, we've also been asked to pray for Rick Deaver's brother, David Deaver, uh, who has stage four prostate cancer. We've been also to remember t uh, asked to remember Tim Hightower, Hightower uh, cancer and is on hospice, nephew of Virginia Grounds. Uh, Janie Riddle, fluid on the lungs, memory issues on hospice. This is the mother of Kelly Rice. Let's remember that situation. And then a friend of Janie Hopkins, uh, Linda Simpson, has uh, some severe esophageal uh, inflammation. And so we want to remember that particular uh, situation. Uh, another addition, uh, Brother Philip uh, shared with me, and Angela, did you say Halsey? Holly. Holly. Uh, has stage four liver cancer. She's going to start treatments, but if the treatments do not work, they're only giving her basically six months to live. Let's pray that God will use uh, the chemo to begin a process of healing uh, in her life tonight. Uh, it's your son's aunt, okay? Also, another one of our church members, Ruby Henry, uh, Ray and Ruby, some of you know they usually sit over in this area here. Uh, Ruby has had some blood loss. They gave her some uh, blood transfusion. She, uh, she's still not feeling just real well, but she is at home. But let's remember her especially tonight and pray for her. So uh, remember her tonight as well, okay? Let's remember the Boltons on our church uh, family. Well, actually up above our servicemen, uh, Josh Carrillo, Tristan, uh, Tristan Williams, and James Plummer, these young men that are in the military. Uh, then the Boltons, uh, Jack and Helen, uh, good to see Alan and Cheryl here tonight. Let's remember Alan Bruns, uh, Mark Clark. Uh, see Michael Garrigan with us tonight. Continues to, looks like he's doing better. Uh, let's pray for Gene Grounds tonight, Tina Henry, uh, Bonnie Hill. This is Don Hill's mother, Janie Hopkins. Uh, Charlene Pritchard came by the church today. She stayed in her vehicle, but she talked to several of us outside and she has finished another one of her infusions. She's just real weak, and, uh, but she is making some progress. Uh, so remember Charlene tonight in your prayers. Let's remember the Schilt family, uh, Larry Schaefer, uh, Jim Tully, Jarrett Turney. Uh, Justin Witt will be having uh, surgery in May. It's uh, some brain surgery. They're going to be doing some, uh, uh, he's got migraines, and they're going to be trying to untwist some, uh, blood vessels in his brain. So that's uh, certainly something to be concerned with. Uh, let's see, I had another one here. Uh, Sandra Lemons uh, on the back page. They've been sitting here towards the back of this first section. Uh, they are not uh, members of our church, but they have been coming and expressed an interest. Uh, but she has a stage four breast cancer and she's had some difficulties the last couple of weeks. Uh, so let's remember her tonight as well and remember her in prayer. And then, of course, pray for the revival. Brother Greg Simmons is our evangelist. I have his name on the spiritual preparation for revival if you'd like to get one of these uh, before you leave tonight. Next Wednesday night, uh, Michelle Roberts is going to help me. Uh, I'm just going to tell you right now, next Wednesday night, we're going to do some praying. 
Uh, we're going to do some prayer walking, if you can do that. We're going to have others of you. We're going to have some tables down here. We're going to ask you to come and sit around a table and pray as a, uh, as a church family. And we're going to do some different things to encourage you to just pray. Uh, I'll share a couple of things before we do that. So I just want to warn you that we're going to pray next Wednesday night. I know that you pray in your seat and all of that, but I want you to remember that, okay? Yes. Mark's doing better, Philip. Mark's doing better. Yeah, so he's doing better. He really is. Okay? All right, so I'm going to lead us in a closing word of prayer. I appreciate you all being faithful tonight. For those of you who are online, uh, pray for the Thirst Conference. Uh, pray for Brother Greg Simmons. There's 29 individuals from Life Action Ministry that are going to be here, okay? Uh, they're going to be here basically with us for a week. And these young people, these uh, individuals have dedicated their life to coming to churches like us, sharing their love, sharing their talents. Uh, they're going to do all the, the, the preaching. They're going to do all of the worship. They're going to be teaching our children. They're going to be teaching our youth. And there's just a lot of things. It's going to be a, a unique situation. I hope that you will plan time. I realize there are things going on that week. Uh, Brother Matt, for one, wherever he's at, his son is, uh, that's in the ministry, Tyler, neighbors, is going to be ordained on that Sunday evening. And he obviously needs to be there with his son. So we understand there's going to be situations that develop like that. But if at all possible, will you set aside Sunday morning, May 2nd through Wednesday night, May the 5th? Because if revival does come, I don't want to miss it. Okay? And uh, so anyway, remember that tonight, okay? All right. We'll close in a word of prayer. If you would like to have one of these, I'll have them up here uh, so you can get a spiritual preparation guide, okay? So let's bow for a closing prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for showing us through this situation with Elijah that fire can fall from heaven that revival, Holy Spirit-led revival can still happen. And Lord, maybe tonight you're just going to have to break through with some of us as believers. And you just are going to show us that you can go beyond the walls that we put up and the attitudes that we have. Lord, there may very well be some individuals that have no desire whatsoever to be, have a, re, uh, a refreshment from you. Well, Lord, I pray that you would put them in a position where they would. I pray, Father, that you would show us, if we truly are believers and that we have been transformed by the saving power of Jesus Christ, then, Lord, I believe somewhere in our spirit, somewhere in our heart, we will have a desire to get closer to you. It has to begin in the house of God. Let it begin in this house. Let it begin in the individual members. And then, Father, help us to take it out from these four walls to our community to the families that are hurting today, to the families that are fractured, to families today that have no hope. Father, get us in the rescue business of rescuing souls for Christ. But Lord, begin in our lives. Do a transformation and a rededication and Lord, revolutionize our lives, beginning right here. Father, we love you. We thank you. Forgive us where we fail you. Show us our sins. Help us to confess. And help us get right with you. We pray this in the majestic name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You are dismissed.